The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Last time, uh, we talked about the spin operator pointing in some particular direction. Uh, there were questions, uh, in fact, there was a, a useful question that uh, I think uh, I want to begin the lecture by going back to it. And um, this, uh, as you received an email from me, uh, the notes have um, an extra section added to it that is stuff that I didn't do in class last time, but uh, I was told, in fact, uh, some of the recitation instructors did discuss this matter. And uh, I'm going to say a few words about it. Now, I do expect you to read the notes. So things that you will need for the homework, all the material that is in the notes uh, is material that I kind of assume you're, uh, you're familiar with, and you've read it and understood it. And, um, I probably don't cover all what is in the notes, especially examples or some things don't go into so much detail, but the notes should really be helping you understand things well. So uh, the remark I want to make is that uh, there was a question last time that uh, better that we think about it more deliberately in which we saw that the Pauli matrices, sigma 1 squared was equal to sigma 2 squared equal to sigma 3 squared was equal to 1. Well, that indeed tells you something important about the eigenvector, eigenvalues of these uh, matrices. And um, it's a general fact. If you have some matrix M, that satisfies an equation. Now, let me write an equation. The matrix M squared plus alpha M plus beta times the identity is equal to 0. This is a matrix equation. You take the whole matrix, square it, add alpha times the matrix, and then beta times the identity matrix is equal to 0. Suppose you discover that such uh, an equation holds for that matrix M. Then, suppose you're also asked to find eigenvalues of this matrix M. So suppose there's a vector that is an eigenvector with eigenvalue lambda. That's what having an eigenvector with eigenvalue lambda means. And uh, you're supposed to calculate these values of lambda. So what you do here is let this equation, this matrix on the left, act on the vector v. So you have m squared plus alpha m plus beta r1 act on v. Now, since the matrix is 0, it should be 0. And now you come and say, well, let's see. Beta times 1 on v, well, that's just beta times v, the vector v. Alpha m on v, but m on v is lambda v. So this is alpha lambda v. And m squared on v, as you can imagine, you act with another m here. Then you go to this side, you get lambda m v, which is again another lambda times v. So m squared on v is lambda squared v. It acts two times on v. Therefore, uh, this is 0. And here you have, for example, that lambda squared plus alpha lambda plus beta on v is equal to 0. Well, v cannot be 0. Any eigenvector, by definition, eigenvectors are not 0 vectors. You can have zero eigenvalues, but not zero eigenvectors. That doesn't exist. An eigenvector that is zero is a crazy thing, because 
this would be zero, and then it would be uh, the eigenvalue would not be determined. It just makes no sense. So v is different from zero. So you see that lambda squared plus alpha lambda plus beta is equal to zero. And the eigenvalues, any eigenvalue of this matrix must satisfy this equation. So the eigenvalues of sigma 1, you have sigma 1 squared, for example, is equal to 1. So the eigenvalues, lambda 1, any lambda squared must be equal to 1, the number 1. And therefore, the eigenvalues of sigma 1 are possibly plus or minus 1. We don't know yet. Could be two ones, two minus ones, one one and one minus one. But there's another nice thing: the trace of sigma one. We'll study more the trace. Don't worry. If you are not that familiar with it, uh, it will become more familiar soon. The trace of sigma one or any matrix is the sum of elements in the diagonal. Sigma one, if you remember was of this form. Therefore, the trace is 0. And in fact, the traces of any of the Pauli matrices are 0. Another little theorem of linear algebra shows that the trace of a matrix is equal to the sum of eigenvalues. So whatever two eigenvalues sigma 1 has, they must add up to 0, because the trace is 0 and is equal to the sum of eigenvalues. And therefore, uh, if the eigenvalues can only be plus or minus 1, um, you have the result that one, must, one eigenvalue must be plus 1, the other eigenvalue must be minus 1. It's the only way you can get that to work. So there's two I sigma 1 eigenvalues of sigma 1 are plus 1 and minus 1. Those are the two eigenvalues. Um, so in that section as well, there's some discussion about properties of the Pauli matrices. And, uh, Two basic properties of Pauli matrices are the following. Um, remember that the spin matrices, the spin operators, are h bar over 2 times the Pauli matrices. And the spin operators had the algebra of angular momentum. So from the algebra of angular momentum that says that Si, Sj, is equal to i h bar epsilon i j k, SK, you deduce after plugging this that sigma i sigma j is 2i epsilon i j k sigma k. Moreover, there's another nice property of the Pauli matrices that having to do with anti-commutators. If you do experimentally try this multiplying Pauli matrices, sigma 1 and sigma 2, you will find out that if you compare it with sigma 2, sigma 1, it's different, of course. It's not the same. This commutator, these matrices don't commute. But they actually, while they fail to commute, they still fail to commute in a nice way. Actually, these are minus each other. So in fact, sigma 1, sigma 2 plus sigma 2, sigma 1 is equal to 0. And by this, we mean that they anti-commute. And we have a brief way of calling this. When this sign was a minus, it was called the commutator. When this is a plus, it's called the anti-commutator. So the anti-commutator of sigma 1 with sigma 2 is equal to 0 anti-commutator defined in general by a, b, two operators is a, b plus b, a. 
And as you will read in the notes, a little more analysis shows that, in fact, the anti-commutator of sigma i and sigma j has a nice formula, which is 2 delta ij times the unit matrix, the 2 by 2 unit matrix. With this result, you get a general formula. Any a product of two operators A, B, you can write as one half of the anti-commutator plus one, no, one half of the commutator plus one half of the anti-commutator. <coughs> Expand it out, that right-hand side, and you will see quite quickly this is true for any two operators. This has AB minus BA, and this has AB plus BA. The BA term cancels, and the AB terms are up to the thing. So sigma I, sigma J, would be equal to 1 half. Let me put the anti-commutator first. So you get delta IJ times the identity, which is 1 half of the anti-commutator, plus 1 half of the commutator, which is um, I, epsilon, I, J, K, sigma, K. It's a very useful formula. In order to uh, make those formulas look neater, we invent a notation in which we take, think of sigma as a triplet. Sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3. And then we have vectors like A, normal vectors, components A1, A2, A3. And then we have A dot sigma must be defined. There's no obvious, well, there's an obvious definition of what this should mean, but it's not something you're accustomed to, and one should pause before saying this, you're having a normal vector, a triplet of numbers, multiplied by a triplet of matrices, or a triplet of operators. Um, since numbers are commute with matrices, the order in which you write this doesn't matter, but this is defined to be a1 sigma 1 plus a2 sigma 2 plus a3 sigma 3. This can be written as ai sigma i with our repeated index convention that you sum over the possibilities. So here is what you're supposed to do here to maybe interpret this equation nicely. You multiply this equation in by ai bj. Now, these are numbers. These are matrices. I better not change this order. But I can certainly, by multiplying that way, I have ai sigma i bj sigma j equals 2 ai bj delta ij times the matrix 1 plus i epsilon ij k ai bj sigma k. Now what? Well, we'll write it in terms of things that look neat. A dot sigma, that's a matrix. This whole thing is a matrix multiplied by the matrix B dot sigma gives you well, a i b j delta i j, this delta i j forces j to become i. In other words, you can replace these two terms by just b i, and then you have a i b i. So this is twice. Um, I don't know why I have a 2. No 2. There was no 2 there. Sorry. So what do we get here? We get A dot B, the dot product. This is, this is a normal dot product. This is just a number times 1 
plus i. Now, what is this thing? You should try to remember how the epsilon tensor can be used to do cross products. This, there's just one free index, the index k. So this must be some sort of vector. And in fact, if you try the definition of epsilon and look in detail what this is, you will find that this is nothing but the k component of a dot b. The k, so I, I'll write it here. This is a cross b sub k. But now you have a cross b sub k times sigma k. So this is the same as a cross b dot sigma. And here you got a pretty nice equation for Pauli matrices. It expresses the general product of Pauli matrices in somewhat geometric terms. So if you take, for example, here, an operator um, no, if you take, for example, a equals b equal to a unit vector, then what do we get? You get n dot sigma squared. And here you have the dot product of n with n, which is 1. So this is 1. And the cross product of two equal vectors, of course, is 0. So you get this, which is nice. Why is this useful? It's uh, because with this identity, you can understand better the operator s hat n that we introduced last time, which was n dot the spin triplet. So nx, sx, ny, sy, and z, sc. So what is this? This is h bar over 2 n dot sigma. And let's square this. So sn vector squared, this matrix squared, would be h bar over 2 squared times n dot sigma squared, which is 1. n dot sigma squared is 1. Therefore, this spin operator along the n direction squares to h bar squared over 2 times 1. Now, the trace of this sn operator is also 0. Why? Because the trace m means that you're going to sum the elements in the diagonal. Well, you have a sum of matrices here. And therefore, you will have to sum the diagonals of each. But each of the sigmas has 0 trace. We wrote it there, sigma 1, trace of sigma 1 is 0. All the Pauli matrices have 0 trace. So this has zero trace. So you have these two relations. And again, this tells you that the eigenvalues of this matrix can be plus minus h bar over 2. Because the eigenvalues satisfy the same equation as the matrix. Therefore, plus minus h bar over 2. And this one says that the eigenvalues uh, add up to 0. So the eigenvalues of s hat n vector are plus h bar over 2 and minus h bar over 2. We did that last time, but we did it by just taking that matrix and finding the eigenvalues. But this shows that uh, it's a property that is almost manifest. And this is fundamental for the interpretation of this operator. Why? Well, we saw that if n points along the z direction, it becomes the operator sz. If it points about the x direction, it becomes the operation, operator sx. 
if it points along y, it becomes sy. But in an arbitrary direction, it's a funny thing. But it still has the key property. If you measure the spin along an arbitrary direction, you should find only plus h bar over 2 or minus h bar over 2. Because after all, the universe is isotropic. It doesn't depend on direction. So a spin one half particle, if you find out that whenever you measure the z component is either plus minus h bar over 2, well, when you measure any direction, it should be h plus minus h bar over 2. And this shows that this operator has those eigenvalues and therefore makes sense that this is the operator that measures spins in an arbitrary direction. Uh, there's a little more of an aside in there, in the notes, about something that will be useful and uh, fun to do. And it corresponds to the case in which you have two triplets of operators, x1, x2, x3. These are operators now. And y equal y1, y2, y3. Two triplets of operators. So you define the dot product of these two triplets as xi, yi summed. That's a definition. Now, the dot product of two triplets of operators defined that way may not commute, because the operators x and y may not commute. So this new dot product of bold phase operators um, is not commutative. Probably. Uh, it may happen that these operators commute, in which case x dot y is equal to y dot x. Similarly, you can define the cross product of these two things. And the kth component is epsilon i, j, k, x, i, y, j, like this. Just like you would define it for two number vectors. Now, what do you know about the cross product in general? It's anti-symmetric. a cross b is equal to minus b cross a. But this one won't be. Because the operators x and y may not commute. Even x cross x may be non-zero. So one thing I will ask you to compute uh, in the homework is it's a, not a long calculation. It's three lines. But what is s cross s equal to? Question there. Yeah, so it's in the dot product. Yes, it's the sum implicit. Just in the same way that here you're summing over i's and j's to produce the cross product. So whenever an index is repeated, we'll assume it's summed. And when it is not summed, I will put to the right not summed explicitly the words. Because in some occasions, it matters. So how much is this? It will involve i, h bar, and something. And you will try to find out what, is, what this is. It's a cute thing. All right. Uh, any other questions? More questions? Nope. OK. So now, uh, finally, we get to that part of the course that has to do with linear algebra. And, uh, and I'm going to do an experiment. I'm going to do it differently than I did it in the previous years. Uh, there is this nice book. Uh, it's here. I don't know if you can read from that far, but it has a pretty um, kind of, you might almost say, arrogant title. It says, uh, Linear Algebra Done Right by Sheldon Axler. 
Uh, this is the book, actually, MIT scores 18700 of linear algebra uses. And you know, when you first get a book that looks like that, you read it and open it. I'm going to show you that this is not that well done. Uh, but actually, I think it's actually true. The title is not a, a lie. It's really done right. Uh, I actually wish I had learned linear algebra this way. Uh, it may be a little difficult if you've never done any linear algebra. You don't know what the matrix is. Or I don't think it's the case anybody here, a determinant or a eigenvalue. If you've never heard any of those words, this might be a little hard. But if you've heard those words and you've had a little linear algebra, this is quite nice. Now, this book has also a small problem. It's uh, unless you study it seriously, it's not all that easy to grab results that you need from it. Um, you have to study it. Uh, so I don't know if it might help you or not during this semester. It may. Um, it's not necessary to get it. Absolutely not. But uh, it is quite uh, lovely, and uh, the emphasis is, is quite interesting. It really begins from very basic things and, and logically develops everything and asks at every point the right questions. It's, it's quite nice. So, uh, so what I'm going to do is, uh, inspired by that, I want to introduce some of the linear algebra little by little, and I don't know uh, very well how this will go. Maybe there's too much detail. Maybe it's a lot of detail, but not enough. So it's not all that great. I don't know. You will have to tell me. And, um, but we'll try to get some ideas clear. And the reason I want to get some ideas clear is that uh, good books on this subject allow you to understand how much structure you have to put in a vector space to define certain things. And unless you do this carefully, you probably miss some of the basic things. Like many physicists don't quite realize that talking about a matrix representation, you don't need brass and cats to talk about the matrix representation of an operator. At first sight, it seems like you need it, but you actually don't. Uh, then the differences between a complex and a vector space, a complex and a real vector space, become much clearer if you take your time to understand it. They are very different. And in a sense, complex vector spaces are more powerful, more elegant, have stronger results. Um, so anyway, it's enough of an introduction. Let's see how we do. Uh, and let's uh, just begin, therefore, our story. So we begin with uh, vector spaces and uh, dimensionality. Yes. The link between the trace of uh, the matrix equals zero and the matrix squared uh, is proportional to the identity. Um, one is the product of the eigenvalues is one, and the other one is the sum is equal to zero. Are those two uh, statements related causally, or are they just separate statements that are observations? Of the oh, okay, the question is what is the relation between these two statements? Those are separate observations. One does not imply the other. You can have matrices that square to the identity, like the identity itself, and don't have zero trace. So these are separate properties. This tells us that the eigenvalues squared are h bar over 2. And this one tells me that lambda 1 plus lambda 2, their two eigenvalues are 0. So from here, you deduce that the eigenvalues could be plus minus h bar over 2, and in fact have to be plus minus h bar over 2. All right, so uh, let's talk about vector spaces and dimensionality. Spaces and dimensionality. So, 
Why do we care about this? Because the end result of our discussion is that the states of a physical system are vectors in a complex vector space. That's, in a sense, the result we're going to get. Observables, moreover, are linear operators on those vector spaces. So we need to understand what are complex vector spaces, what linear operators on them mean. So, as I said, complex vector spaces have subtle properties that make them different from real vector spaces, and we want to appreciate that. In a vector space, what do you have? You have vectors and you have numbers. So the two things must exist. The numbers could be the real numbers, in which case we're talking about a real vector space. And the numbers could be complex numbers, in which case we're talking about a complex vector space. We don't say the vectors are real or complex or imaginary. We just say there are vectors and there are numbers. Now, the vectors can be added. And the numbers can be multiplied by vectors to give vectors. That's basically what is happening. Now, these numbers uh, can be real or complex. And the numbers, so they're vectors and numbers. And we will focus on just either real numbers or complex numbers, but either one. So uh, these sets of numbers form what is called in mathematics a field. So, uh, I will not define the field, but a field is used the letter F for field. And our results, I will state results whenever, doesn't matter whether it's real or complex, I may use a letter F to say the numbers are in F, and you say real or complex. So uh, what is a vector space? So the vector space, V, vector space, space, V, is a set of vectors, of vectors, with an operation called addition. And we represent it as plus, that assigns a vector u plus v in the vector space when u and v belong to the vector space. So for any u and v in the vector space, there's a rule called addition that assigns another vector. This also means that the space is closed under addition. That is, you cannot get out of the vector space by adding vectors. The vector space must contain a set that is consistent in that you can add vectors and you're always there. And there's a multiplication with a, and a scalar multiplication. Application. by elements of the numbers of f such that a, which is a number, times v belongs to the vector space when a belongs to the numbers and v belongs to the vectors. So every time you have a vector, you can multiply by those numbers. And the result of that multiplication is another vector. So we say the space is also closed under multiplication. Now, these properties exist, but they must, uh, these operations exist, but they must satisfy the following properties. So the definition is not really over. This these operations 
satisfy one. U plus V is equal to V plus U. The order doesn't matter how you sum vectors. And here, U and V in V. Two, associative. So U plus V plus W is equal to U plus V plus W. Moreover, two numbers, A times B times V, is the same as A times BV. You can act with the first number on the vector and you add with the second. Three, there is an additive, additive identity. And that is what is a vector zero belonging to the vector space. I could write an arrow, but actually, and it, for some reason, mathematicians don't like to write it because they say it's always unambiguous whether you're talking about the zero number or the zero vector. We do have that problem also in the notation in quantum mechanics, but here it is. Here is a zero vector such that, that zero plus any vector v is equal to v. Four, well, in the field, in the set of numbers, there's the number one, which multiplied by any other number keeps that number. So the number one, the one that belongs to the field, satisfies that one times any vector is equal to the vector. So we declare that that number that doesn't mu multiply by other numbers is an identity, is an identity also multiplying vectors. Yes, there was a question. There is an additive identity. Additive identity, the zero vector. Finally, uh, distributive laws. No, I'm one second. One, two, three. The zero vector. Oh, I actually in my list I put them in different orders in the notes. So, but never mind. Five. There is. There's an additive inverse for in the vector space. So for for each v belonging to the vector space, there is a u belonging to the vector space such that v plus u is equal to zero. So additive identity, you can find for every element its opposite vector. It always can be found. And last is distributivity, which says that A times U plus V is equal to AU plus AV, and A plus B on V is equal to AV plus BV. And A's and B's belong to the numbers. A and B's belong to the field. And U and V belong to the vector space. OK. Uh, it's, it's a little disconcerting. There's a lot of things. But uh, actually, they are quite minimal. They're all kind, it's well done, this definition. There are all kinds of things that you know that follow quite immediately um, by little proof. So you will see more in the notes, but let me just say briefly a few of them. So here is the additive identity, the vector 0. 
it's easy to prove that this vector zero is unique. If you find another zero prime that also satisfies this property, zero is equal to zero prime, so it's unique. Um, you can also show that zero times the ve any vector is equal to zero. And here, this zero belongs to the field, and this zero belongs to the vector space. So the zero, you had to postulate that the one in the field does the right thing, but you don't need to postulate that zero, the number zero multiplied by a vector is zero. You can prove that. And these are not difficult to prove. These are, all of them are one-line exercises. They're done in that book. You can look at them. Um, Moreover, another one, a, any number times the zero vector is equal to the zero vector. So in this case, those both are vectors. That's also another property. So the zero vector and the zero number really do the right thing. Then another property, the additive inverse. This is sort of interesting. So the additive inverse, you can prove it's unique. So the additive inverse is unique. Additive inverse is unique. And it's called for, for V is called minus V, just a name, and actually, you can prove it's equal to the number minus 1 times the vector. <laughs> might, might sound totally trivial, but go tr try to prove them. They're all simple, but they're not trivial, all these things. So you call it minus v, but it's actually this is a proof. OK. So. Examples. Let's uh, do a few examples. I'll have five examples that we're going to use. So I think the main thing for physicists that I remember being confused about is the statement that there's no characterization that the vectors are real or complex. The vectors are the vectors and you multiply by real or complex numbers. So I will have one example that makes that very dramatic. Uh, <laughs> as dramatic as <laughs> it can be. <laughs> uh, so one example of vector spaces. The set of n component vectors. So here it is, a1, a2, up to a n, for example, with capital N, with a i belongs to the real, and i going from 1 up to n, is a vector space, space over r, the real numbers. So, People use that terminology, a vector space over the kind of numbers. You could call it also a real vector space. That would be the same. You see, these components are real. And you, you have to think for a second if you believe all of them are true or how would you do it. Well, I would have to, if I would be really precise, I would have to tell you a lot of things that you would find boring. That, for example, you have this vector and you add a set of b's, well, you add the components. That's the definition of plus. And what's the definition of multiplying by a number? Well, if a number is multiplied by this vector, it goes in and multiplies everybody. Those are implicit, or you can fill in the details. But if you define them that way, it will satisfy all the properties. What is the zero vector? Must be the one with all entries zero. What is the additive inverse? Well, change the sign of all these things. So 
it's kind of obvious that uh, this satisfies everything if you understand how the sum and the multiplication goes. Another one, it's kind of similar to the set of M cross N matrices with complex entries. Complex entries. So here you have it, A11, A12, A1N, and here it goes up to AM1, AM2, AMN. With all the AIJs belonging to the complex numbers, then I'll erase here. Then you have that this is a complex vector space. Is a complex vector space. How do you multiply by a number? You multiply a number times every entry of the matrices. How do you sum two matrices? They have the same size, so you sum each element the way it should be, and that should be a vector space. How, here is an example that is perhaps a little more surprising. So the space of two by two Hermitian matrices is a real vector space. Space. You see, this is, uh, or can be easily thought as a naturally thought as a real vector space. This is a little surprising because Hermitian matrices have eyes. You remember the most general Hermitian matrix was of the form, well, um, A plus, no, let's see, C plus D, C minus D, A plus I, B, a minus I, B, with all these numbers, C, D, being real. But they're complex numbers. Why is this naturally a real vector space? The problem is that if you multiply by a number, it should still be a Hermitian matrix in order for it to be a vector space. It should be in the vector. But if you multiply by a real number, there's no problem. The matrix remains Hermitian. You multiply by a complex number, you lose the Hermeticity. Put an I somewhere here for all the factors, and it will not be Hermitian. So this is why it's a real vector space. Multiplication by real numbers are preserves Hermeticity. Hermeticity. So that's uh, surprising. So again, illustrates that you know nobody would say this is a real vector, but it really should be thought as a vector over real numbers, vector space over real numbers. Two more examples, uh, and um, they are kind of interesting. So so the next example is a set of polynomials as vector space. So that, again, is sort of a very imaginative thing, the set of polynomials. polynomials. P of z, p of z. Here, here, z belongs to some field, and p of z 
which is a function of z, also belongs to the same field. And each polynomial has coefficients. So any p of z is a0 plus a uh, 1z plus a2z squared plus up to some a n z n. A polynomial is supposed to end. That's pretty important about polynomials. So the, the dots don't go up forever. So here it is, the ai's also belong to the field. So look at these polynomials. They have the letter z and they have these coefficients which are numbers. So a real polynomial, you know, of 2 plus x plus x squared. So you have your real numbers times this general variable that it's also supposed to be real. So you could have it real, you could have it complex. So that's a polynomial. How is that a vector space? Well, it's a vector space, the space P of f of those polynomials, polynomials, of all polynomials, of all polynomials, else, is a vector space over f. And why is that? Well, you can take, again, there's some implicit definitions. How do you sum polynomials? Well, you sum the independent coefficients. You, will, you just sum them and factor out. So there's an obvious definition of sum. How do you multiply a polynomial by a number? Obvious definition, you multiply everything by a number. If you sum polynomials, you get polynomials. Given a polynomial, there's a negative polynomial that adds up to 0. Uh, there's a 0 when all the coefficients is 0. And it has all the nice properties. Now, this example is more non-trivial because you would think, as opposed to the previous examples, that this is probably infinite dimensional because it has the linear polynomials, the quadratic, the cubic, the quartic, the quintic, all of them together. And uh, yes, we'll see that in a second. So set of polynomials. Uh, five, another example, five. The set f infinity of infinite sequences. Sequences x1, x2, infinite sequences where the xi's are in the field. So you got an infinite sequence and you want to add another infinite sequence where you add the first elements, the second elements. It's like an infinite column vector. Uh, sometimes mathematicians like to write column vectors like that because it's practical. It saves space on a page. The vertical one just you start writing and and it just the pages grow very fast. So here's an infinite sequence. And it's think of it as a vertical one, if you wish. And all elements are here, but there are infinitely many in every sequence. And of course, uh, the set of all infinite sequences is infinite. So this is a, comp a vector space over f, again, because all the numbers are here. So it's a vector space over f. over f. And last example. Our last example is a familiar one in physics. Is the set of complex functions in an interval. Set of complex functions on an interval well, x from 0 to L. So a set of complex functions f of x, I can put here, on an interval that. So 
this is a complex vector space. Vector space. The last uh, three examples, probably you would agree that they're infinite dimensional, even though I've not defined what that means very precisely. But that's what we're going to try to understand now. We're supposed to understand the concept of dimensionality, so let's get to that concept now. So in terms of dimensionality, to build this idea, you need a definition. You need to know the term subspace of a vector space. What is a subspace of a vector space? A subspace of a vector space is a subset of the vector space that is still a vector space. So what, that's why it's called subspace. It's different from subset. So a subspace, space of V is a subset of V that is a vector space. So in particular, it must contain the vector 0 because any vector space contains a vector 0. Um, one of the ways you sometimes want to understand a vector space is by representing it as a sum of smaller vector spaces. And we will do that when we'll consider, for example, angular momentum in detail. So you want to write a, a, a vector space as a sum of subspaces. So what is that called? It's called a direct sum. So if you can write, here is the, the equation. You say V is equal to U1 direct sum with U2 direct sum with U3 direct sum with Um. When we say this, we mean the following, that the Ui's are subspaces of V and any V in the vector space can be written uniquely written uniquely as A1 u1 plus a2 u2 plus a m u n with u i in capital u i. So let me review what we just said. So you have a vector space and you want to decompose it in sort of basic ingredients. This is called a direct sum. So this is called, V is a direct sum of subspaces. Direct sum. And the UIs are subspaces of V. But what must happen for this to be true is that there's, once you take any vector here, you can write it as a sum of a vector here, a vector here, a vector here, a vector everywhere, and it must be done uniquely. If you can do this in more than one way, this is not a direct sum. These, two, these subspaces kind of overlap. They're not doing the decomposition in a minimal way. Yes? Um, does the expression of V have to be a linear combination of the vectors of U or just sums of the U sub i's? It's an arbitrary, it's some linear combination. So you see a general, if, Look, the, the interpretation, for example, R2, the normal vector space R2, you have an intuition quite clearly that any vector here is a unique sum of this component along this subspace, 
and this component along this subspace. So it's a trivial example, but uh, the vector space R2 has a vector subspace R1 here and a vector subspace R1. Any vector in R2 is uniquely written as a sum of these two vectors. That means that R2 is really R1 plus R1. Yes? Is it redundant to say that it's this A1, because A1, U1 is also in big U sub 1. So oh, oh, yes, redundant. you're right. No, I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't write those. I'm, I'm sorry. That's absolutely right. I, I'm, if I had that in my notes, it was a mistake. Oh, thank you. That was very good. Did I have that in my notes? No, I had it as you said it. True. So can be written uniquely as those, a vector in first, a vector in the second, and the A's are absolutely not necessary. OK. So let's go ahead then and uh, say the following things. Uh, so here we're going to try to get to the concept of dimensionality in a precise way. Yes. What? M. Right. The last one is M. Thank you. That's <coughs> here. So all right. So here, here begins the concept of dimensionality of a vector space is something that you intuitively understand. It's sort of how many linearly independent vectors you need to, to describe the whole set of vectors. So that is the number you're trying to get to. Um, I'll follow it up in a slightly rigorous way to be able to do infinite dimensional space as well. So, we will consider something called the list of vectors. List of vectors. And that will be something like v1, v2, vectors in a vector space up to vn. Any list of vectors has finite length. So we don't accept infinite lists. By definition. OK, so you can ask, once you have a list of vectors, what is the, ve the vector subspace spanned by this list? So how much do you reach with that list? So we call it the span of the list, the span of the list, the n, and it's the set of all linear combinations, A1, V1, plus A2, V2, plus An, Vn, for Ai in the field. So the span of a list is all possible products of the vectors on the list added and, and, and put like that. So if um, we say that a list spans a vector space, if the span of the list is the vector space. So that's natural language. We say, OK, this list spans the vector space. Why? Because if you produce the span of the list, it fills a vector space. OK, so, so I, I could say it that way. So, here is the definition. V is finite dimensional. Dimensional. If it's spanned by some list. If V is spanned by some list. List. 
So why is that? Because if the list is a definition, finite dimensional, if it's spanned by some list. If you got your list, by definition, it's finite length, and with some set of vectors, you span everything. So, and moreover, it's infinite dimensional if it's not finite dimensional. <laughs> it's kind of silly, but uh, <laughs> infinite, a space V is infinite dimensional, infinite dimensional if it is not finite dimensional. Which is to say uh, that there's no list that spans the space. So for example, this, this definition is tailored in a nice way. Like, let's think of the polynomials. And we want to see if it's finite dimensional or infinite dimensional. So I, you claim that it's finite dimensional. Suppose, let's see if it's finite dimensional. So we make a list of polynomials. That the list must have some length, at least, that spans it. You put all these 730 polynomials that you think span the list, span the space in this list. Now, if you look at the list, is 720, you can check one by one until you find what is the one of highest order, the polynomial of highest degree. But if the highest degree is, say, z to the 1 million, then any polynomial that has a z to the 2 million cannot be spanned by this one. So there's no finite list that can span this. So this set, uh, the example in four, is infinite dimensional for sure. Example four is infinite dimensional. Well, uh, example one is finite dimensional. You can see that because we can produce a list that spans the space. So look at example one. It's there. Well, what would be the list? The list would be list. You would put a vector e1, e2, up to en. And the vector e1 would be 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. The vector e2 would be 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, and go on like that. So you put 1s and zeros, and you have n of them. And certainly, the most general one is a1 times e1 plus a2 times e2. And you got a list. So example 1 is finite dimensional. A list of vectors is linearly independent. A list is linearly independent, independent if a list v1 up to vn is linearly independent if a1 v1 plus a2 v2 plus a n vn is equal to 0 has the unique solution a1 equal a2 equal all of them equal 0. So that is to mean that whenever this list satisfies this property, that if you want to represent the vector 0 with this list, you must set all of them equal to 0, all the coefficients. That's clear as well in this example. If you want to represent the 0 vector, it must have 0 component against uh, the basis vector x and basis vector y. So the list of this vector and this vector is linearly independent because the 0 vector must have 0 numbers multiplying each of them. So finally, we can. Um, define what is a basis. A basis of B 
of V, basis of V, is a list of vectors in V that spans V and is linearly independent. Independent. So what is a basis? Well, you should have enough vectors to represent every vector. So it must span V. And what else should it have? You shouldn't have extra vectors that you don't need. It should be minimal. It should be all linearly independent. You shouldn't have added more stuff to it. So any finite dimensional vector space has a basis. It's uh, easy to do it. And uh, there's another thing to, that one can prove. It, it may look kind of obvious, but it, it requires a, a small proof that if you have the bases are not unique. It's something we're going to exploit all the time. One basis, another basis, a third basis. We're going to change bases all the time. Well, the bases are not unique, but the length of the basis of a vector space is always the same. So the length of the list is a number is the same whatever base you choose. And that length is what is called the dimension of the vector space. So the dimension of a vector space, space is the length of any basis, basis of V. And therefore, it's a well-defined concept. Any base of a finite vector space has the same length, and the dimension is that number. So there was a question. Yes? Uh, is there any difference between bases, like orthogonal, orthogonal, or non-orthogonal, or like all these have pure orthogonal? No, absolutely not. You could have a basis, for example, of R2 which is this vector, the first, and the second is this vector. And any vector is a linear superposition of these two vectors with some coefficients, and it's unique. You can find the coefficients, basically. So we differentiate those bases? Yes, but you see, here is exactly what I wanted to make clear. Uh, we're putting the vector space and we're putting the least possible structure. I didn't say how to take the inner product of two vectors. It's not a definition of a vector space. It's something we'll put in later. And then we will be able to ask whether the basis is orthonormal or not. But the basis exists. Even though you have no definition of an inner product, you can talk about basis without any confusion. You can also talk as a, about the matrix representation of an operator, and you don't need an inner product, which is something that is sometimes very unclear. You can talk about the trace of an operator, and you don't need an inner product. You can talk about eigenvectors and eigenvalues, and you don't need an inner product. The only thing you need the inner product is to get numbers, and we'll use them to use brass and cats to get numbers. But it can wait. It's better that you see all that you can do without introducing more things, and then introduce them. So let me uh, explain a little more uh, this concept. We were talking about this base, this uh, vector space 1, for example. And we produced a list that spans. E1, E2, up to En, and those were these vectors. Now, this list not only spans, but they're linearly independent. If you put A1 times this plus A2 times this, and you set it all equal to 0, well, each entry will be 0, and all the A's are 0. 
So this ease that you put here on that list is actually a basis. Therefore, the length of that basis is the dimensionality, and this space has dimension n. Um, you should be able to prove that this space has dimension m times n. Now let me do the Hermitian, uh, this, uh, this matrices and try to figure out the dimensionality of the space of Hermitian matrices. So here they are. This is the most general Hermitian matrix. And I'm going to produce for you a list of four vectors. Vectors, yes, they're matrices, but we call them vectors. So here is the list. The unit matrix, the first Pauli matrix, the second Pauli matrix, and the third Pauli matrix. <coughs> All right, let's see how far do we get from there. OK, this is a list of vectors in the vector space because all of them are Hermitian. Good. Do they span? Well, you calculated the most general Hermitian matrices of this form. You just put arbitrary complex numbers and require that the matrix be equal to its matrix uh, complex conjugate and transpose. So this is the most general one. Do I obtain this matrix from this ones? Yes, I just have to put 1 times C plus A times sigma 1 plus B times sigma 2 plus D times sigma 3. So any Hermitian matrix can be obtained as the span of this list. Is this list linearly independent? So I have to go here and set this equal to 0 and see if it sets to 0 all these coefficients. Well, it's the same thing as setting to 0 all this matrix. Well, if c plus d and c minus d are 0, then c and d are 0. If this is 0, it must be a0 and b0, so all of them are 0. So yes, it's linearly independent. It spans. Therefore, you've proven completely rigorously that this, this vector space is dimension 4. Um, this vector space. I will actually leave it as an exercise for you to show that this vector space is infinite dimensional. You say, of course it's infinite dimensional because infinite sequences. Well, you have to show that if you have a finite list of those infinite sequences, like 300 sequences, they span that. Uh, they cannot span that. So that uh, it's takes a little work, and it's interesting to think about it. I think you will enjoy trying to think about this stuff. So um, that's our discussion of dimensionality. So this one is uh, a, a little harder to make sure it's infinite dimensional. And this one is yet a bit harder than that one, but it can also be done. This is infinite dimensional. Dimension, and this is infinite dimensional. In the last minute, I want to tell you a little bit one definition and uh, let you go with that. Is the definition of a linear operator. Now, so here is uh, one thing. So it's you can be more general, and we won't be that general. But when you talk about linear maps, you have one vector space and another vector space, V and W. This is a vector space, space, and this is a vector space. And in general, a map from here can, is sometimes called, if it satisfies some property, a linear map. 
And the key thing is that in all generality, these two vector spaces may not have the same dimension. Might be one vector space and another very different vector space. You go from one to the other. Now, when you have a vector space V and you map to the same vector space, this is also a linear map, but this is called an operator or a linear operator. And what is a linear operator, therefore? A linear operator is a function T, let's call the linear operator T, takes V to V. In which way? Well, T, I'm sorry, T acting on U plus V on the sum of vectors is T U plus T V. And T acting on A times a vector is A times T of the vector. These two things make it into something we call a linear operator. It acts on the sum of vectors linearly and on a number times a vector, the number goes out and you act on the vector. So all you need to know for what a linear operator is, is how it acts on basis vectors. Because any vector on the vector space is a superposition of basis vectors. So if you tell me how it acts on the basis vectors, you know everything. So we will figure out how the matrix representation of the operators arises from how it acts on the basis vectors. And you don't need an inner product. The reason people think of this is that they say, oh, the Tij matrix element of T is the inner product of the operator between i and j. And this is true. But for that, you need brass and inner product, all these things. And they're not necessary. We'll define this without that. We don't need it. So see you next time. And uh, we'll continue with that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.